Hey, thanks for tuning into the podcast. And before it begins, I have a favor to ask. I'd love to hear your honest feedback about the podcast. So please call our listener line at 631 800 631-800-3579. Leave a message and let me know your thoughts. The show description also has my contact information. Okay, now on with the show. Welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast, where we explore the muse and the music from the North Shore to the South Shore, from New York City to the Hamptons. Navigating the wellspring of original music from singer-songwriters and musicians from Long Island, New York. Hi, I'm Steve Yusko from GigDestiny.com. Stay tuned as we explore the Long Island Sound. What an interesting guest on today's podcast. Bill Scazzari is from Long Island. But after listening to his music, you would think he was from the Midwest, the South, or out West. His music is honest, granular, organic, and it touches your soul. So happy to have him in conversation, and we'll hear three of his songs, and I'd like you to take a listen to It All Matters, and then we'll be back with the show. Only love 
love can set you free. Do you know how it all matters to me? Do you know how it all matters to me? Do you know how it all matters? With each episode of the podcast, I find myself on the road to discovery. Each bend in time holds a mystery beyond the next corner. Today's guest is a welcome treasure to my ears. And with each lyric, he calls my mind to ponder. The crunch of a gravel road below resonates with a voice that is both conversational and reflective. Bill Scazzari's music is akin to the musings of Tom Waits, John Prine, and John Moreland. His songs are a conversation where we can savor his poetry. The message echoes in our souls with every instrumental break. Bill's music is both organic and timely. With each creative muse, I really can't wait to see where he leads us. Hey, Bill, welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast. Great to have you. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. It's... um. And I, I mean that when I talk about a discovery in each guest, this is music I would never run into. Um, it's just, uh, I, I think I'm pretty diverse in what I listen to, but I've been amazed over the months of the wellspring and diversity of music of people right here on Long Island. Mm-hmm. And when I listened, and I really delved into your music, I, I, I dipped my toe in the water, let me say, for the past three days with your music. And it really, uh, what I just said is I really believe it. It was really engaging and i found myself with the instrumentals just kind of really thinking about what you just sang about and it's it's kind of a a neat back and forth so um anyway there i go yapping too much as usual as my wife says in the beginning of the podcast but um bill uh, tell me where did you i I read your bio your epk and everyone can find it online in, in the chapter marks it's a very interesting background uh, you started out pretty young, about eight years old, if I recall, with a guitar, correct? Yeah, it was my first guitar when I was eight. It was a gift from my mom and dad, yeah. Yep. And uh, for me, the guitar was a struggle, and I played the three chords and put it down for 10 years and picked it back <laughs> up again, which yeah. is probably not uncommon for a lot of our listeners. How did, how did it go for you? I mean, did it really just gravitate and you stuck with it? or? No, you know, I, I did not like lessons um you know they, they i got the guitar and it came with lessons and and i um i really just didn't like the lessons at all and um so uh once once i wiggled my way out of that i um kind of started figuring things out on my own you know, i was listening to records and um trying to figure out how to make those sounds decipher them so to speak yeah yeah so, uh, yeah. that, pro- that probably, no pun intended, that probably plays into uh, you, you do some really great finger picking in, in your music. Oh, and that that uh, that had to be the foundation for it, figuring it out, um, you know, where I come from, you know, I'm a strummer, <laughs> you know, but the finger yeah. picking really puts nice accents on it. Yeah. yeah. So, so where, where did, you, did you grow up uh, on the North Shore? Where Where was home? Originally. Yeah, well, yeah, I was I was actually born in Queens, uh, New York, and um, but didn't stay there long. Moved on to on to Long Island uh, with my family, um, uh, and have been here ever since. Yeah, I think I think guys of our age, that seems to be the migration. My parents were from uh, uh, Brooklyn and Queens, and and took the. Right. The big trip out to the country, so to speak, back in yeah, the-, the country, right? Yeah, we when I was growing up, there was actually uh, they had a goat across the street. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty neat, and it was a it was a mean old goat too. And, uh, what town? Ta- what town was that? If you don't mind, that me was asking. in Huntington. Yeah, and okay. it um, believe it or not, um, yeah, and, and one day um, it chased us, you know, neighborhood kids into my mom's kitchen. <laughs> Size. <laughs> It was actually pretty funny thinking about it now, but it wasn't funny then. But um, 
I, it's, I, like, I mean, you wouldn't imagine that when you think of, you know, Huntington or, or even most of Long Island, unless you go you know, further east. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, my daughter used to teach out at a 4-H camp and, you know, they have goats and chickens and all that. And goats are the weirdest looking thing. If you ever look in their pupils, they got square oh, pupils. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. yeah, yeah. Otherworldly in my opinion. Yeah. So, and, there was a, and there was a dairy farm down the road. I mean, we used to, we used to walk there and uh, go sleigh riding and um, ice skating on the, uh, on the pond that was there. Down in uh, Heckscher or? Uh, uh, no, no. Up no, in no. Uh, Ashland Farms. Ashland Farms. It was, oh, um, wow. Cool. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But now, it's, you know, it's a development now. So. now. You know what's interesting? In listening to your music, the farthest place I would ever guess you as an artist to live would be Long Island. I could yeah. see I could see you in Oklahoma or Kansas, uh, any other state. You know, it was just it was kind of interesting to me to to discover your music and and uh, what you put together. Oh, wow. So, yeah. you, how did you gravitate towards uh, Americana? I guess is or folk or. Well, I was actually um, in a cover band, um, classic rock cover band, which is more along the lines of what you'd expect. Um, on Long Island, I would think, um, sure. for the most part. Um, and I was uh, doing some research on Blind Willie McTell. Oh, ah, okay. Googled, Googled his name and came up with a um, uh, a festival that uh, <clears throat> that had already passed, but you know the the site was still up and running, and uh, they had icons for the artists that had performed at the festival and one of them was Justin Towns Earl who I had never heard of I had never heard of Steve Earl even at that point mm-hmm. um, and you know I was just kind of exploring things so I clicked on the icon and it was a um, live at paste recording of him singing uh, uh, Mama's Eyes okay and I listened to it and I listened through it to the end and I was like oh that was really cool and I kind of went around the site checking some other things out and I was like I gotta go back to that song and Went back. I played. I must have played it about five or six times, and it just it just kind of took hold of me. And really, um, just really stunning uh, writing. You know, storytelling and story fits the music. And you know, when the story ends, the music ends. There's nothing extraneous in it. It was all just right to the point, and just every minute of it was just gripping to me. And um, I went out and I bought. All three of his records, I think, at that point, he had three, um, Yuma, Midnight at the Movies, and um, uh, The Good Life. Mm. And um, just listened to them, listened to them, and listened to them, and I tried to figure out some some, some of the songs, uh, John Henry, all that finger-picking, and that's where I really started to try to learn finger-picking, and, and I never quite got it the way that he does it. Um, right. Probably not even close, but... Um, He's got such an amazing style, but uh, that's what started it for me. And I, I kind of, it's you know, a little funny. I kind of went back to the band. I said, "Hey guys, you, let's let's check this stuff out." And they were not interested. Um, <laughs> I kind of talked them into doing a couple of songs, and we actually played out a couple of songs, and they just didn't want any what? part of it, which was cool. You know, it's, you know, everyone likes what they like. But um, for me, it was a calling. You know, and I needed to, I needed to. Uh, investigate and find out more and find out, you know, branch out from there. And, and that's what I did. And um, eventually um, started trying to write in that style. And I guess, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's how it all started. Um, you know, I, I know blind Willie McTell from the band, the band song is, is right, I don't, right. Uh, right? That's, uh, yeah, yeah. that's where that com- comes about. But it's interesting when you, you know, but as I was listening to your mu- music, and I purposely don't look at a guy's or a gal's EPK mm-hmm. uh, because I want to draw my own, I guess, uh, conclusions about what I'm hearing. You know, yeah. and and uh, and John Moreland came to mind um, mm-hmm. uh, as far as the style, um, which I only um, you know got to hear his music maybe four or five years ago mm-hmm. and and uh and tom waits it really it kind of it kind of resonated in a great way and what i like about your voice is that it's gravelly in a way that it it draws me into the lyric if does that make sense because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm i'm a little more attentive um to to kind of get it and That's a good thing. 
Yeah. yeah, no, it is a great thing. And what's interesting, and I found this just personally listening to Bruce Springsteen and what he's doing now with Western Skies and, and acoustic versions of his music right. is, oh, yeah, that's the lyric. Oh, I get it now. You know, right. it really right. uh, gives that ability to ponder and kind of soak it in, which is, is really kind of nice, you know. So, Bill, in, in, I'm, I'm always interested in the songwriting process. Uh, you seem very prolific in, in your writing. There's a lot, a lot of lyric in your song. Um, did it, did it begin in high school with you with writing or where, where did you really become a, a singer songwriter in your mind, you know, with original? Uh, well, in my mind, I'm still trying to be, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's every song is, is a new, um, adventure, a new mm -hmm. endeavor. Uh, a new struggle, a new conquest, a new journey. Yeah. So it's, um, but uh, I mean, probably um, I was writing really, um, really early. Uh, I'm trying to think back. When would that be? So that could possibly even be like junior high school age, but it's not anything where, um, I would say, oh yeah, I wrote songs back then because there there was just you know, yeah, try, trying things out and trying phrases and 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 it was probably I don't remember any of it, but probably very um, very cliche and very um, probably not very good. <laughs> but, yeah, I I remember for me in high school it was uh, a creative writing class where, uh, you know, you can kind of open up your mind and yeah, you can put your thoughts down and it's and it's worth something somewhere. Right. Right. Yeah, that that opened up my mind to at least try poetry back then. Um, and then I revi revisited it later in my life um, where uh, nice. a muse will come to me and I'll, I may expand upon it. I'm no songwriter by any means, but um, maybe to evacuate my brain, it's good for me to put things down, <laughs> you know, right. put some assembly. Well, now, I, now I, you know, if I hear, if I hear somebody say something, you know, overhear a conversation, I hear something interesting or just you know, anywhere, um, I'll, I'll, you know, put it down in my phone and, and, um, um, I just keep like kind of a running log of things. Or if I think of something on the spot and, um, I'll just write those things down. And then, you know, when I, when I get the urge to start writing again, then I'll sit down and some, sometimes I don't really pay attention to those things that I've, that I've kind of written down. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I feel like I, I've got something fresh going on that I want to work with and see what comes out and, and I'll do that. But if I get stuck, sometimes I'll go back. Or if there's something in particular that I remember that I wrote down that I wanted to, um, you know, think about some more and, and, and explore some more, um, I might go back to that and then see how it, would fit into a song or if it would. And, and there've been a number of songs that um, have come entirely uh, from that. Um, I've got my new records coming out uh, on August 19th of this year. And um, one of the songs is mostly from when I was on tour for my third record. Now I'm free um, in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, went to the West coast and back Um and um, during that time, you know, sometimes I would be, you know, five or six hours or sometimes 10 or 15 hours driving between, wow. you know, places where I was going to play. And, you know, I'm by myself um, and um, you have to pass the time. So, so one of, one of the things that I was doing to pass the time was I was writing haikus. Oh, um, okay. And um, so I did that a couple of times. Uh, out on the road. And then when I got back at the end of that tour on uh, the end of 2019, I kind of, I sat down with that and, uh, you know, haiku five syllables, seven syllables, five, five syllables. Um, and I, and I looked at those and I said, you know, I need, I need a fourth line. So mm -hmm. right, let me make it seven syllables. So I'll, I'll kind of stick to the format a little bit. And, uh, so I did that. So I wrote a fourth line for each one of those and I had a certain number of verses um, and I started thinking back about the experiences that I had on the road and I just wrote some more, um, in that format, five, seven, five, seven, 
uh, with wow. songs and um, wrote a chorus to it. And there's uh, a song. Um, and so a lot, a lot of things do do come together from those those notes that I that I take from day to day. And um, you know, it could be things that I've written down years ago. Sure. Um, I've just got this running, very unwieldy kind of running tab <laughs> in this notepad in my phone that um, every once in a while I dare to look at. What I find interesting, and I've spoken to other musicians, being on the road or being encapsulated in a car where you have X number of hours is a very productive time creatively, you know, and I don't know if it's the hum of the road or whatever, it affects people in different ways, but that seems to be a common denominator with a lot of singer songwriters that I've spoken to. Now we did, we did hear that song uh, on the intro. It all matters. Do you want to talk about how that came about? And uh, that's on your um, through these waters album. Is that correct? Through these waves. Yeah. Through these waves. That yeah. was uh, 2017. Yeah. 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 So was that an easy one to come across or, you know, how did you? Let me think back to that. So that, that song, I remember writing the music. Um, there was an instrumental part. So, so, so when I, when I had discovered Justin Towns or also I had come from this cover band and it was all mostly about soloing and, Mm -hmm. And that was the research I was doing was all about soloing. And when I discovered Justin Towns Earl, it was more about songwriting. So I kind of put the soloing aside and focused on this. Is, that's about 2010 or 11, maybe. Okay. Um, or maybe even nine, 2009. Um, but I started, I really just put the soloing completely aside um, and just focused on songwriting. And, um, with uh, by the time I got to uh, the Now I'm Free album, which I guess I, I was writing, I started recording that in 2018. I think it was mm -hmm. or towards the towards the beginning of 19. Um, I had kind of gotten back to all right. I spent so much time focusing on songwriting. I would like to try to incorporate some of the skills that I have with soloing um, rather than just doing straight finger picking mm -hmm. and uh, having other musicians come in and, you know, fill out the other parts. So, so with it all matters, I was actually mostly noodling, just figuring out okay. fun stuff to play, um, you know, solo lines and, then I thought, all right, so I've got this. And so what do I do with it? And I didn't mm -hmm. know what to do with it. And another time period, months probably later, I started writing the song itself. It all matters mm. and with the lyrics and with the verses. And I thought, all right, you know, that's going to fit in here. So let me make that fit in here. So I, you know, changed some things around, changed the timing around, changed, changed the length of the riffs around and, and, put it all together. And that's how that, that's how that song came about. Um, so that's kind of the period of time when I started to, to go back to you know, doing a little bit more than just rhythm finger picking and, and song. Now, now, as far as the development of the lyrics and, and the music, you're, you're pretty much a sole practitioner when it comes to approaching that. And I'm not talking about once you get into the studio with other musicians, do you really have, kind of the complete model before you get into the studio? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so when I write, um, you know, I'll finish the song. Uh, you know, I, I, generally I'll come up with the music first and then um, um, I just kind of let the music come out. And, however gotcha. it does. and then I try to think to myself, well, what what's behind, what's the emotion behind this melody or, or this, the, this chord pattern, um, what's, what are, what are the lyrics that are trying to be told, you know, through right. The, what are you trying to emote? Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Through, through the music. So, you know, then I kind of search for that and I kind of see where it is and, and I start writing things down and I start changing it. And 
sometimes the first chorus will become the last chorus and everything moves around, you know, cut them in half and put this half over there and, and things can change pretty wildly. Um, hmm. Even when I think I'm finished and I just think, no, you know, this just doesn't feel right. You know, I'll get to a point in the song where I feel like the song is good. Um, but there's always that one point in this one verse where it just feels like, oh, it's not quite, mm-hmm. quite right. And so I've learned to kind of go back and fix that. And, um, so there's that, there's that process of, of doing that. And, um, well, why don't we, why don't we do this? Let's just take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm really want, I'm really interested on how you approach your studio work because you've done work in Nashville and recording here up in Long Island. I'm, I'm interested in that process and how the, the final product uh, uh, comes together, the final yeah. creation. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, Steve Yusko from Gig Destiny here. Well, as you're probably listening to this podcast, you're probably thinking about that musician who would make a fantastic guest here on the Long Island Sound. But we'd like to hear their story. We'd like to hear their music. So have them reach out to us at gigdestiny.com and we'll explore their craft. Now, back to our podcast. Hey, everyone. We're back with Bill Scuzzari. And Bill, you know, we were talking before I cut you off (laughs) about how you approach uh, the final product, the final creation. So if you can expand upon that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. I I mean, like after going through that process of constantly moving things around, um, then I will start, you know, it's on on paper. It's mostly on paper. I may not have all the verses memorized. Um, But when I feel like I'm not changing that much anymore, then I start to try to memorize it. And as I'm memorizing the lyrics, um, you know, I, I, I start to get away from the paper and, and start trying to perform them. Uh, mm. And then phrasing comes more naturally. So words will change during that process. And when I finally gotten through all that and everything seems to be what it's going to be in, in final form, then I commit the entire song to memory and I start working on, um, phrasing and delivery and you know where where is the best best point to take a breath um and i and i kind of lock all those things in so so it becomes a a um consistent uh performance when i when i go through the song over and over and over again and then and that that lets me that gives me the freedom to to change things when i'm performing because okay. I, cause I know I know where my um, where my touch points are, so so I can I can kind of deviate from that, but I know where I need to land to get to the next point, you know, to make the song flow the way that I want it to. So this is, I mean, there's there's so many times that I'm going through this song from from the point where I start to write it to the point where I'm actually ready to perform it. Uh, that when I get in the studio. Uh, it's just, it's, it's all there. And, um, you know what I, I find interesting about that. I really like, I personally like public speaking and in hearing your process and going through it, I, I do the same thing when I'm, I'm writing a speech or making, uh, you know, a major presentation. Um, I actually will go through that and yeah, I do my editing. Uh, first I, I throw every, all the spaghetti against the wall cause I don't like to edit on the fly. Hmm. Then I go through it and then I go through it and then I put just the phrasing in, you know, how do I, you know, I'm going to pause here. I'm going to throw silence in here in my public speaking. Um, and then I, pra- <laughs> I practice it in front of my wife and, and my daughter, who, my, my daughter's a great editor and, you know, I, you know, cause it's what to me to get that feedback from them, at least in public speaking Sure. It's not so much what I think I'm saying. It's what they're hearing that I want to get that feedback from. Nice. Uh, and maybe that's the same when it comes to, so now, you, now, now you've kind of memorized, you've got it together. You've got that freedom because you've got a foundation of the points and the phrasing you're going to make. You're bringing it. Tell me about your studio process with other musicians and taking what you've just given birth to and, um, arrangement and that sort of thing. I'm curious yeah. about the process. Well, it's been a little different from, from album to album, but uh, generally, like I said, you know, I have, I, I have the song the way that 
I'm ready to perform it. Um, mm-hmm. And and it's funny because because I say that, but then by the time the record's done, so much time has passed that the way that I'm performing the song after that point is so much different. And I always feel it's so much better. But oh, know, interesting. Like, that's that's just you know personal um, um, critique. Um, where you it's, evol- it's evolving? Would you say? Yeah, it's evolving even after it's been recorded, and it's and almost always it it. Like I look back at the record and I say, oh, you know, I'm not doing it that way anymore, but it's still, it's good that people can hear it on the record. And, um, but the process has been different from record to record. Um, with, with, uh, the first record that I did, uh, I did hear on Long Island at, uh, Paradil, uh, records with, uh, Bill Herman. And, um, actually, um, I think I recorded about 70 songs with Bill. Hmm. And at one point he said, Hey Bill, why don't you take, why don't you take a handful of these songs and finish them <laughs> and, and make a record. <laughs> Pretty subtle. <laughs> cause, cause, yeah, Cause I mean, it was just like vocal and guitar. Yeah. So, you know, and I had so many of them. So, so, so we did that. We picked out, a, picked out a bunch and we finished them and I put out the first record. So, um, but then uh, we brought in, some local guys to, um, to fill in, uh, the other instruments. Um, so that was how that one was done with the second record. Um, that was produced by Jonah Tolchin. We did that one in, uh, East Nashville at the bomb shelter. Mm. And, um, it was pretty much live for the most part with some overdubs. Um, trying to think now we had we had Joaquin Cooter came in on drums um John Estes played bass uh and Matt Murphy uh, also played bass um different songs uh Jonah played guitar um Danny Roman also played guitar uh Chris Scruggs came in later put down some pedal steel um trying to think Kim Ritchie came in and sang a harmony um Oh, who else? Uh, Annie Johnson is a mu- musician that I had met in uh, Massachusetts. Happened to be in Nashville at the time that we were there and called her in to do a, to a second vocal part, which was pretty awesome. Nice. Um, oh, who else am I missing? Oh, Laura, Laura Joe Metz. He uh, used to play guitar for Sturgill Simpson. Um, oh, I know I'm missing some people. Uh, Will Kimbrough. Um, but mo- mostly we played live and recorded live, and then mm-hmm. afterwards maybe added a couple of instruments uh, just to supplement what was there. So, so that was that was very different than the first record where I recorded my parts and then everyone kind of gotcha. over the everything, drum space, everything. Now you, um, you, I'm sorry, interrupting you. No, again. it's all right. No, it's all right. Um, I mean, so the third, third record was like the second where we play live. And in fact, um, the longest song on the record, I mean, I think it's, I think it's almost 11 minutes long. Mm -hmm. Um, We were, we were about three or four days into the recording sessions and uh, we were getting towards the end of the day. And I said, Hey, um, I just want to want you guys to play. I'm just going to play these four chords for like 11 minutes. I just want you to play. On it, right. whatever. Add the, add the spice, right? Just you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. On it, just, just let's go. And uh, they're like, all right, let's do it. And first take, first take. Really, we got through an eleven-minute song. And I was like, all right, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you hear. Um, it's called "Yes, I Will." That's what you hear on the uh, "Now I'm Free" record. Um, first take, and I, th- I think. Um, I think I think there was like a, a, a couple of seconds of overdub where Amy right. Amy, Amy McLaughlin. Oh, he's someone I left out from you, Amy McLaughlin. Um, Don't worry, we're we're going to hit up everybody in the chapter marks. Uh, it's yeah, so they can link to all those people. They get the credit. Yeah, give everyone credit because they're all awesome. But um, I think he went back and he did like a four second additional little thing in one spot. Um, nice, which was really cool. But uh, so now, so now you you have the albums done. And you've, you've gone out on tour across the country. 
Uh, you've done the, the the Newport Folk Festival. So are you going out solo um, and and doing the album, or how do you how did you approach that? Maybe you approach it different ways on different tours, but. Well, New, Newport, um, I had um, Juan Solorzano. Um, he was uh, he played electric guitar on that album. Uh, he's from Nashville. I asked him if he would join me on stage in, in Newport, and he said sure. And uh, Charlie Mensch um, was recommended to me as a bass player, and uh, so he came in. And uh, Jonathan Predis, um from Long Island, um, wow, great. Miles to Dayton. Um, yeah, yeah. He came out too and played cello, um, which and the whole thing was was amazing. I mean, we met we met there the night before in the hotel. Really, <laughs> we rehearsed, rehearsed the forty minute set uh, in the hotel and just got up and played, and uh, it was amazing. It was and amazing. it worked. <laughs> it worked. Great. We got standing ovation, and uh, oh, that's and great. Chris Funk from the Decemberist had. Uh, Asked me to do it, and um, one of my favorite very, bands, in December. Very thing. Yeah, great band, and great. Uh, very thankful for him for doing that. And he said, you know, do another one, and so we did did an encore, and uh, it was you know top of the world. It was it was amazing. That's great. It was so cool. Yeah. Hey, let, let's talk about the next song we want to um, uh, expose to the world here, um, Holy Man. Tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll take a break and and have everybody listen to it. So, Holy Man, I actually wrote. After attending Newport Port Folk Festival, uh, probably uh, 2014, maybe. Okay. Um, and just, you know, just having such a great time there. I mean, I've been there maybe eight or nine or ten times. Oh, wow. Uh, but um, just, it, it's so energizing and just so amazing to see all the bands and just, just the vibe that's there is, is just very uh, uplifting and very, very cool. And... I just had all that, that energy um, and it translated into that strumming rhythm, that, that, that backbone for the song. And, um, you know, the lyrics come from a different place. God knows where <laughs> Right. They, exactly. They, and and um, there it was. Yeah, Wonderful. It was, yeah. All right. So let's, let's take a listen to Holy Man. We'll be right back after the song. So I drank some more water And I drank some more wine Got no answers to my questions why I got no answers to my questions why So I ran from the altar And I hid from the light And I stumbled and I faltered As I stood up to fight And I questioned the wrong And I questioned the right I got no answers to my questions why I got no answers to my questions why So I've been friended a holy man who had just lost his way And with suspended disbelief I stood judged and betrayed He said, son, all you need is to kneel down and pray The Lord gives, the Lord takes it away The Lord gives, the Lord Takes it away. Oh, take it away. Shifted my view, I confused my emotions. I have searched for the truth, 
Through the noise and the notions and the days of my youth, I have learned to look up to the sky. Without answers to my questions, why? I have learned to look up to the sky. Without answers to my questions, why? I don't need answers to my questions. Hey, everybody, we're back. I really appreciate that song. Uh, I've been listening to the song for the past two days, and uh, that's one of my favorites um, awesome. as, I, as I get deeper into uh, Bill's music. So, um, you know, uh, what's, what's interesting uh, to me in, in your career, I, I, I think we're around the same age. You're probably a younger man than me. You have this, I would say, newfound fame relatively later in life, uh, you know, uh, not on the downslope, on the upslope, I think. And I find it so refreshing. I mean, uh, and I guess I look at it, at least for myself, even with starting this podcast, which I love doing, is with uh, the silver lining to the COVID and having too much time on my hands to think, right. uh, gives us a chance to kind of smell the roses and say, you know what? I really want to do something I love. I enjoy doing. And that's, that's my assumption with you, Bill is, is what you've done after your initial career. And then you've kind of really been very prolific with touring and all these great things. It's really kind of, kind of neat. I think. Yeah. 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 I I feel very, very lucky um, to have been able to do and still do um, that and um, kind of transition. Um, from the, you know, being an attorney into, um, playing music and, you know, writing and, um, taking it as far as it's gone. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, there's so many people I've spoken to, you know, musicians who just have such great talent and they've had those choices when in their life where it's okay, I've got to get the job to support my new family and, and the house, and those who've taken the leap and stumbled and everything else in, in between. Um, so I, I, th- I think you are blessed. You are fortunate that you can, you can do this and you can bring this joy to the world through your muse and your music. And, and now that COVID is relatively over, uh, you know, touring and things are opening up again. Uh, so I, you know, I can only speak for myself, you know, uh, my wife, Debbie and I, when we go out, man, we're looking for live music and we're looking for something new. Well, that's um, great. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just, it's, I'll, I can tell you a quick story. So I've, I've had some guests, my wife, who's <laughs> my best critic and best friend mm. actually said to me, you know, wow, you're actually pretty good at this. <laughs> you know, which mm. I, and I fell on the floor and she picked me up and, uh, <laughs> and um, one of our friends, a uh, recent guest, uh, uh, Nico uh, Patton was playing out East and we went to see her. It happened to be my wife's birthday this past Sunday. And and Debbie on the ride home, she goes, you know, I really kind of like meeting your peeps. <laughs> like the, yeah, awesome. These are all my peeps now, you know. So it's, you um, it's a lot of people say, well, what, what do you get out of doing this? You know, I said, I get to meet some of the greatest creative people in the world. And they're my neighbors, basically, yeah. on Long Island, you know. That's the best part is the community. You know, it's uh, the interaction, the, the – um, um, you know, the share, sharing the stories and, and um, that was, that was one of my favorite things. And, um, you know, being on the road, you know, go from town to town and people come out to see you. So they want to speak with you and, and just speaking with them. And I got to hear, you know, their stories. Like I, I wanted to hear their stories, you know, I sure. try to ask them their name and then ask them, you know, about themselves. And, and um, it was, it's really amazing. It's, like, it's just like the magic you said that happened after the Newport Festival, how it really kind of juiced you up to be creative with Holy Man. Yeah, um, yeah. And and that community or that that vibe, that spirit, that that kind of is a thread that runs through people. And 
what I find interesting, and we were all we're all diverse and we're all alike. And uh, you know, finding yeah, yeah, I went through through something similar that you went through, you know, and making that connection yeah. with a stranger, you know, that's kind of kind of neat. It makes us all uh, realize we're all brothers and sisters in this big yep. human world. Absolutely, uh, yeah. <laughs> that we live in. And I, I, I I'm pontificating. I. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I can't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's a good thing to pontificate about it because it's true. You know, it's it's uh, it's what it's all about. It's the connection. Yeah. Hey, how did you how did you go from Long Island to uh, you know making these connections in Nashville and stuff like that for you? Was it relatively easy? I mean, uh, it you know it just kind of happened. Um, yeah. I had gone to Americana Fest in. Um, uh, in uh, Nashville and I had met, uh, Jonah Tolchin, uh, actually first became friends with his guitar player, Danny Roman. And, um, after a while, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> wound up doing a concert out here in Centerport, um, okay. with, uh, Jonah and, uh, Frank Fairfield, um, Tom Marion, Zach Sokolow. Um, and at the concert, um, I spoke with Jonah a little bit and I gave him, I think I gave him, I think I gave him one of my records um, mm -hmm. and I said, hey, man, you know, just kind of in passing here, check it out and uh, hope to see you on the road somewhere. And uh, a couple of months later, he messaged me and, um, offered to produce my next record just like uh, that wow yeah just like i mean what it wasn't just like that it was actually a really long time mm -hmm. but it, but it was you know when it happened it was just like that and it and it was really um i said yeah let's do it and uh so we spent some time talking and he came out here a couple of times and i went up to uh, where he was living then in massachusetts and uh we went through some songs and we picked out what we thought would be the right ones to do and uh you know, at some point in time we wound up uh in nashville and uh putting it all together um, yeah you know it's interesting you have that new collaboration you know i talked to you about being a sole practitioner at least from the creative standpoint and now you're it's kind of like a leap, I would assume. You're handing something over and you're trusting to work in producing an album and, and taking their expertise and, and keeping mm -hmm. true to your vision. So the collaborative effort of someone producing your record has to be a bit of a challenge because you've taken these children, these songs that you've created, uh, and you're handing, handing over the, you know, the delivery of them. So it's, it's got to be uh, an interesting back and forth through that process. You know, um, with with the first record, it was it was so much of my input on it um, that there was there was a little bit of that. But but I I actually was ready to to do that. And you know, walking into a studio with with, with the um, musicians and artists that I mentioned uh, is a very humbling thing. And mm. um, and I was happy to, um, you know, let them do what they do because they do it so well. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't about to, uh, say, no, no, it should be this way or that way. Um, what they were doing was amazing to begin with. And, you know, as far as, as far as production is concerned, you know, Jonah and I kind of thought along the same lines to begin with. Okay. Um, and, um, I don't think we really had very many disagreements at all, if they were even that. Um, That's great. So, so, and, and it was actually, honestly, it was kind of a weight off, you know, um, mm. not having to worry about that aspect of it, just being able to go in there and say, all right, I'm going to play my guitar and sing. And if there's another way you want me to approach this, just let me know. I'm happy to do that. I'm going to not even think about that or what everyone else else is doing. So I felt really good um, about having them do what they do on, on all these songs. And with the production, um, it was the same kind of thing. It really just kind of freed me up to focus on my playing and my singing and not, really having to worry so much about 
you know, what comes next and, and, um, how to approach things. And, uh, it worked out really well. It was really, really an awesome, awesome experience. That's nice. It's like handing the wheel over. Okay. You handle the wheel for a while. I've got yeah. the road, the roadmap and the provisions and let's, let's go and do our thing. That's, that's yeah. kind of neat. And, and with, with the third record, it was, um, same kind of thing with, uh, Nielsen Hubbard produced that one. Uh, Joe, Joe Henry was actually going to produce it and, um, we were ready to go and, and, um, then he got his uh, cancer diagnosis. So we had no, I'm to sorry. postpone and yeah, we postponed a couple of times and, um, I had already booked uh, my tour and we were just running out of time. And he said, Hey, Bill, you know, um, I'm fine. If, if, you know, you need to have somebody else, I'll even help you, you know, find somebody, find yeah. somebody fill, fill the chair, produce his chair. And um, so I wound up having uh, Nielsen do it. And Nielsen is awesome. Nielsen um, co-produced my uh, fourth album, which is coming out now, uh, the crosswinds of Kansas. And, um, so Nielsen is amazing. Um, really enjoy working with him. And we just actually, I just got back from Nashville. Oh, not too long ago, a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> is that when you're working on a, a video uh, yeah. for the album? Yeah, we're doing it. So he also does um, videos and um, produces videos. And uh, yeah, so so we were in Kentucky and Nashville. Nice. And shot, shot two music videos there. and um, Not so a bad not a bad time to be down there before the heat rolls in, I guess. Right? Yeah, no, it was amazing. It was, it was a nice little trip, short trip, but but really good. And um, you know, tur- turning turning the wheel over to all all of these really super talented people is not a hard thing to do. Yeah, it's an easy decision. It's not a hard thing to do. You know, yep. so the, the fourth the fourth album. Um, the approach is a little bit different because of COVID. So my my plan was right after the tour in 2019 to go, you know, right. And then go back to Nashville, same guys, Nielsen and the guys down there and um, do the same thing, record it live. And then, you know, everything got shut down. So I was here at home in New York um, really with nothing to do uh, and not able to go anywhere. So I had been building studio here um over the years and, and, you know, my spare time really kind of slowly and probably never would have finished it. Um, except that now I had a reason to. So, so I spent the next couple of months finishing it. So I finished the built out and, uh, well, I tell you when, when I happened to see your studio at a, a circumstance, I was like, Oh my God, this is like the best studio man cave I've ever seen in my whole <laughs> life. I didn't want to yeah, leave. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Really- it's a really cool space. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a really cool space. And um, so yeah, so I f- I finished it and um, said, all right, I still can't go anywhere, so I might as well get to work. So I, so that so this record is very different again, um, where it's mostly me, mm-hmm. um, recording myself here in New York, um, acoustic guitar and vocals. And again, waiting, you know, not, nobody knew what was going on with COVID, how long it was going to last. I'm thinking, all right, when I get to Nashville, I'll bring these guys in, you know, they'll cover this, they'll cover that. And it just never ended. So I kind of got to that point again where I said, all right, you know what, let me go back to my initial inclination, which was solos and soloing over things Mm. Um, let me see how it turns out. So, so I did that. So it worked out. Okay. You know, I, I played electric guitar on a couple of songs, uh, played mandolin on a song. I played a dobro. Um, and I had taken up playing nice. native American flute. Um, gosh, probably four or five years ago now. It's been a while. So I decided, all right, let me, let me do, let me do these parts. You know, I'll do, I'll do what I can for as long as I have to until things open up again. So I played electric guitar on, um, uh, two or three songs. Um, nice. and no three songs. Yeah. And, uh, mandolin on one, the dobro part, uh, mm. I had taken up playing native American flute uh, about five years ago. So I, I did, uh, that on some of the songs and, um, yeah, and uh, then when things kind of slowed down with COVID, um, 
you know, people were getting vaccinated and it seemed to be working just before the Delta variant um, started to take hold. Uh, I went to Nashville and we brought brought in all those guys again. And, um, you know, uh, Michael Rennie, um, Dan Mitchell, Nielsen Albert played drums. A um, uh, bunch of people, Will Kimbrough came in, Brent Burke came in on Dobro. Uh, Juan Soliano again played guitar and Chelsea McGow played cello and uh, Mia Rose Lynn came in, sang harmony. Um, two ladies, uh, they call them the Scholl sisters, um, Marie Louie and um, Cindy Richardson Walker, amazing vocalists, really amazing vocalists. They came really? at, at the, at the end and um, sang some, some uh, backup uh, vocals on a bunch of songs. And um Kind of a very long story as to how this happened, but uh, I had a, um, a Navajo man who's become a friend of mine, uh, Ty Allison. Kind of a long story as to how this happened. So getting involved with the Native American flutes, uh, super long story. I'm going to really cut right to the chase. <laughs> uh, I wound up learning how to speak in Navajo um, really? through the wow. flute maker. It made these flutes for me and um, sang a Navajo lyric to that, to what's even now my longer song than the last record. It's about 12 minutes long, speaking in Navajo on it, as well as English. And um, Ty, Ty Allison, a uh, Navajo man who made, made two flutes for me for this record. He sings a little chant at the end of that song. And it's, and it's really amazing. It's just so good to have been involved with him and, and him and his friend, um, Caleb Bidon and, and his dad, uh, David Bidon, taught me how to speak. And wow. It's like a whole just amazing. Yeah, and, it is uh, amazing. To have him actually also on the record was a really cool thing. So, Bill, I really want to cover the last song that you brought to the table. It's just what I want to know. So you can tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll let the audience hear that song. Yeah, it's just what I know. Uh, that's off the Now I'm Free record. Yeah, it's just uh, it's it's just a song that just kind of came right out, you know. <laughs> all came came out just all in about, one piece, right? All in one piece, and and I, I love when that happens. Um, and usually, they're they're when that happens, they're really simple um, songs, and the the message is really clear. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that one came together. That was a fun one to do. Nice. So let's take a listen to. It's just what I know. And we'll be right back after the song. of you today My thoughts always seem to stray somehow That's where my mind goes That's where my mind goes And I know that heaven is where you are But I haven't figured it all out just what I know It's just what I know my peace with time but time can be so impatient time can be so unkind I've seen how the time goes I've seen how the time goes it goes like a lock without a key though I'm strong enough to just let it be Makes me crazy Makes 
towards west of nowhere Cause I remembered how you talked about it So now that's where I'm going That's where I'm going And I know I'll find heaven If I should find you there About this I swear I have no doubt what I know It's just what I know It's just what I know It's just what I know Hey, everybody, we're back. We just heard It's What I Know and uh, really love that song. You've got like four albums under your belt right now, I think, right? Yeah, Yeah. with the new one coming out, yep. New one coming out that's called The Crosswinds of Kansas, and that's coming out in August, is it, uh, Bill? August 19th. It'll it'll hit radio. uh, I think the first single is going to be the first week of June, and the second single will be the first week of July. Uh, I think the official ad date is sometime in july and then it's released in august on the 19th yeah cool. well i wish you all the best with that you're yeah. going to be playing locally uh in june right yes the uh, uh in patch hog at the down by the creek uh it's a house concert um hosted by mike williams so yeah you can check out my website www.billscrizari.com uh check my shows page and uh, that will be there and yep. uh, thinking about touring um, beyond that. I'm not sure uh, what the plans will be, but. Uh, well, hopefully. if you need a podcast host to go with you, my wife will be happy <laughs> to, you you know, know just to mix, like. just to mix it up. I mean, you got the Dobro, <laughs> you've got the slide, you know, how many podcast hosts do you see in a band? You know, <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I, and I, I, I'm honest about this. I really, uh, I'm looking forward to getting into more of your music. I mean, I've had a couple of days uh, in my spare time to listen. And it's really been a pleasure, Bill. Really, Thank really you. just some some great stuff. I end, my po- I end my podcast this way, Bill. Um, and a f- good friend of mine told me this. Actually, Joe Torrey told him this uh, when he was volunteering for something. And he said, you know, we know what we have in our bank accounts and what we own. We never know how much time we have left. So the fact that you gave me an hour plus of your time here this evening is a real blessing, and I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Until next time, be generous with your joy. Keep your spirits high and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Thank you for listening 
and please support our musicians. If you like the podcast, please rate, comment, and subscribe. If you want to partner with us, visit gigdestiny.com. Hit that donate button. We appreciate your support to keep the conversation alive. Take care. Be well.